What were the 10 most important weapons of ancient Egypt's new kingdom? Ancient Egypt fascinates a huge number of people around the world and has done for a long time for a great number of reasons. But as a military historian, and my background is as an archaeologist, but specifically the medieval period, I'm fascinated by all things to do with weapons, armour and military technology and warfare and tactics. And so I've turned my eyes to ancient Egypt, specifically here, the New Kingdom. I've picked the New Kingdom because I think the arms and armour are perhaps the most interesting in this period. And also it's a period of Egypt's particular military might and comes hot on the footsteps of a period of changing in the technology that was available to the military. So I am Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria, the series of friends and clubs and this YouTube channel of course. And I am a former archaeologist and here I'm going to be looking at the 10 most important weapons of ancient Egypt's new kingdom. But before we dive into that, I want to tell you about an amazing offer I've got with the sponsors for this video who are Wondrium. Now as demonstrated by the topic of this video, I absolutely love learning about new things that relate to things I already know. And I'm currently researching Egyptian weapons and Egyptian history, and therefore Wondrium was an absolutely fantastic resource to me. But Wondrium's got absolutely thousands and thousands of hours of lectures and courses, documentaries that are going to interest you. If you're interested in the content of this channel, you're going to be interested in a lot of the things on Wondrium. Not only are the courses and documentaries on Wondrium absolutely fantastically produced, very, very professionally, but they're also led by top level academics and um, experts in the subjects that they're covering. It's got constantly evolving content, so pretty much wherever you log on, whether it's on your PC or your television or your mobile phone, wherever you want to watch it, when you log on, you're very, very often going to find a whole bunch of new content that you want to watch on there. The most recent series that I've been watching on there is The Real Ancient Egypt, which is led by four current practicing Egyptologists, absolute experts in their field. And it's absolutely blooming fascinating. It's got nine episodes, but in the Tutankhamun episode, something that I found out that I absolutely didn't know is that he might have died as a result of battle. I always thought he died of disease, but actually the embalming fluid that he was embalmed with went into his bone in a place where it possibly had been cut or broken. So there is a possibility that he died as a result of a wound gotten in battle. Bear in mind, this is a king who was buried with a chariot, a whole bunch of bows and archery equipment, two coppishes and loads of weapons. And I also found out that possibly his mother was Nefertiti, but we don't know. Mind blown. Now, while Wondrium has got an absolute ton of content, and I have to admit that I mostly look at history on here, I noticed that if you want to do fitness courses, you've also got some really, really good options there, or if you want to do cookery or photography or any other specific skill. So if you want to check it out for yourself and see what's on there that interests you, you can start a free trial right now. No commitment, you can check out the free trial absolutely free. Um, so you can click that link below down in the description, or you can go to wondrium.com slash scholargladiatoria, which helps show your support for my channel as well, and shows them that you've watched my promo here. But if you go to wondrium.com slash scholargladiatoria and try your free trial now. And thanks once again to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. So now let's get back to these 10 most important important weapons of ancient Egypt's new kingdom. Just briefly, one thing you're going to notice during the explanations for the weapons and development of weapons during the new kingdom is that it was hugely a result of the so-called Hyksos people. Now, the Hyksos are by many described as an invasion um, and a foreign uh, rule over a sort of colonial rule over uh, Egypt, over the kingdom of Egypt. Other people argue that the Hyksos weren't, uh, and this was a cultural shift, a cultural change, um, and it's, it's confused by the fact that Egyptian sources of the New Kingdom have some degree of propaganda in them as well. So I'm not going to get into that, that's not my remit, but the important thing for you to know is that this period of Hyksos rule, and then the New Kingdom that comes afterwards, is an amazing period of innovation, particularly technology and uh, military technology specifically for this video. So the absolute main thing that changes everything is the introduction of bronze, of that is the alloy of copper and tin, and more specifically, good quality bronze making, both complex structures, but also the metallurgy of the bronze itself, making effective weapons. So the Hyksos uh, foreign rule of Egypt introduced new bronze items and new types of weapon 
and use of horses, but we'll get to that in a minute, which completely changed the Egyptian New Kingdom military compared to what had gone before, for example, in the Middle Kingdom. Um, there is a stark difference between the Egyptian militaries of these periods. Now, first up, it absolutely has to be the spear. Throughout history, prehistory, the spear has been the most important weapon of mankind. And ancient Egypt was no exception. The spear was the most important weapon of ancient Egypt going all the way back into the early periods. But even in the New Kingdom, even with the introduction of new types of technology and new types of weapon and ways of fighting, the spear remained the most important weapon of the main infantry of Egypt's New Kingdom. The New Kingdom spear was relatively short. It was about the same height as a person. So uh, for me, that'd be about six foot tall. Obviously, ancient Egyptians are a little bit shorter, but nevertheless, about the height of a person, and it was almost always used with a relatively large shield. Now, there were some innovations in this period. The spearhead in this period has two important changes to it. Number one, it's now made of bronze. Uh, in earlier periods, obviously, originally they were made of flint, and then subsequently made of copper. Um, there were even uh, some references to hardened wooden heads, uh, so just sharpened sticks, basically. Uh, but obviously, a bronze spearhead far a more effective metal for hard wearing and keeps a better edge for longer. Um, and they were socketed, that's the second point. So a socket, in other words, they fitted over the end of the shaft, which means they're far more securely attached and you can stab much harder with them. This accompanied also with the shape of the point, perhaps optimized for armor piercing, um, or durability as well. So essentially the spearhead in Egypt's New Kingdom had become made of better material, better attached to the shaft, and better shaped for penetration. Now without a shadow of a doubt, the second most important weapon, particularly for Egypt's infantry, was the bow. Now bows had been popular in Egypt for a very, very long time, and simple wooden bows had been used for centuries and centuries. But in the New Kingdom period, what comes along is something called the composite bow. Now a composite bow is made of a composite, that is multiple parts, of wood, horn and sinew. Now these bows could come in a number of shapes. Uh, one of the most famous shapes from this period is a sort of triangular shape when it's strung. It's interesting to note that when these bows are unstrung, they looked curved like a normal bow shape, but they're actually curving forwards. When you string them, they curve back and assume a triangular shape. Aside from that, there were also simple curved bows and the simple wooden bows did stay in use as well during this period. So while composite bows are a far more efficient energy transferer, so they keep more of the energy you put into them and therefore they shoot an arrow a lot further or through thicker armor or whatever, um, they're far more efficient bows. The simple wooden bow is perhaps more durable and certainly cheaper and easier to make. Composite bows take a long time to make and are a little bit more prone to damage. So, um, both types of bows were still in use, but the composite bow was really a new type of technology which enabled the Egyptians to make their archers, uh, both on foot and mounted, and we'll talk about that as we go along, far more effective than they had been previously because literally they can shoot arrows further now. And obviously the further away you can engage the enemy, the more effective your archer is gonna be because you can spend more time getting more arrows into the enemy formations and therefore having a greater effect on the enemy before you come to hand-to-hand -hand combat with them. These composite bows were still relatively long compared to later period bows, about four or five feet long, and they were made of a composite we read of references to birchwood, also to a bull sinews, and also to goat horn. So specific materials were chosen for their optimum um, benefits to the to the machine. These bows were long and complicated to make requiring a high level of skill and for that reason they were very expensive and time consuming and uh, they were taken in tribute from defeated enemies because obviously if you could capture bows that would be a very effective way of gaining more of them for your army. So much so that Ramses III uh, took over 600 bows from the defeated Libyans for example. It's also worth mentioning that like the spearhead also arrows in this time gained bronze socketed arrowheads and that also made the machine as a whole more effective because the arrowheads being more durable and stronger and better for penetration, they would have more effect on enemy, particularly enemy wearing armor. Now, number three on my list are javelins. And some people might say, well, haven't you already mentioned spears? Yes, you can throw a large spear, but these javelins used in the New Kingdom were specifically made as throwing spears. So they are shorter, they are lighter, about half the length perhaps of a typical spear and therefore about half the weight, possibly even lighter made with thinner shafts because they're not 
primarily designed to be used in hand to hand combat, although there's some iconographic evidence to suggest they were maybe sometimes used as stabbing implements as well, a bit like a Zulu spear. But primarily, they weigh shorter, lighter throwing spears used by all sorts of troops, both on foot and mounted, and they were carried in quivers, much like arrows, so multiples of them. You'd carry a whole bunch of them in a quiver and you could throw them, and of course they could be retrieved again and reused if you then advanced forward and drove the enemy back. You could pick them up and throw them after them again. Um, so javelins, very, very popular, used in a variety of different ways, and these were also furnished with the funky new socketed bronze heads. It's also worth mentioning that while javelins obviously can't travel anywhere near as far as an arrow from a bow can, relatively short distance weapons, they can nevertheless penetrate armour and shields in some cases more effectively than arrows can, so they were perhaps more useful in relatively close combat against more heavily equipped opponents. The fourth weapon is the sling. Now this often gets overlooked in Egyptian warfare and books about ancient Egypt because the sling wasn't necessarily a glamorous or uh, an expensive or high status weapon that gets a lot of attention in Egyptian warfare, but there are references to it. Now, every ancient culture seems to have used slings and slingers to some extent. It was very widespread in the ancient world, um, and uh, it was also an incredibly cheap weapon. So the main advantage of the sling is it means that if you want to augment your force of missile troops, for example archers, and you only have a certain number of bows, you only certain have a certain number of trained archers, if you need to, you can get levied troops with slings. Now with number five, we come to hand weapons, and the first, and perhaps in some ways the most important one after the spear, would be the mace. Now, maces were very, very popular up until the New Kingdom, and remained in use in the New Kingdom as well, despite the fact that other weapons came in, which we'll look at in a second. But the mace, um, traditionally, had often had a stone head, some Sometimes a ball shape, sometimes a flattened disc shape, and various others as well. And they also had a strong association with power and authority and kingship, and still are in the modern world. The mace is still a symbol of authority and state power today, still used in the UK's parliament, for example. So the mace was probably the most important sidearm. That is a short weapon you can wear by your side, um, much like a pistol in the modern world or a knife. Um, it was the most important sidearm in ancient Egypt until the New Kingdom, so therefore it would be very often carried by archers or spearmen or people um, riding chariots, for example. It would be carried as their backup sidearm uh, with a stone head. As we enter the New Kingdom, other weapons start to take its place as popular sidearms, which we'll see in a second. But also the mace does stay in use, sometimes with a stone head, and now sometimes with new bronze or copper heads as well, in a variety of different shapes. Now number six I have termed the hand axe. It's a one-handed axe that in many ways, as I've mentioned, started to replace the mace which went before it. So it fulfilled the same role, it was a backup weapon, it was a sidearm, almost all the time. So it became, in the New Kingdom, pretty much the de facto most popular, most omnipresent form of sidearm, the hand axe. And a new design had come along. So formerly in the Middle Kingdom, for example, we find broad, long-edged types, which uh, were very effective for chopping into meat, uh, however, not so effective against armour. In the New Kingdom, we see the adaptation of a new type of axe which has a narrower, sometimes so-called duckbill-shaped blade. So it has a shorter cutting edge, but a longer projecting blade, and usually thicker in construction and stronger, more like a modern hatchet, which would be more effective against armoured opponents. And one theory goes that these were specifically devised for fighting against, for example, Hittites and Syrians, who tended to wear more armour than the Egyptians were used to fighting against, and so this wasn't a sort of anti-armour or armour fighting, fighting optimised axe with a different shape to the earlier types that had gone before. The earlier types did stay around, they just weren't so popular, and the standard axe in the New Kingdom becomes this duckbill shaped axe, and we see it in the hands of archers, charioteers, 
pharaohs even. A curious note about Egyptian axes incidentally is that they don't usually have any form of socket. They are usually bound, they, they insert into the shaft and then they're bound to it with bindings. Even these later period um, sort of armoured fighting optimised duckbill bladed um, axes are usually bound to the shaft. Late in the New Kingdom swords do start to replace these axes to some extent but it should be noted these axes are incredibly prevalent during the New Kingdom. One of the most popular and successful therefore types of weapons of the New Kingdom are shown all over the art and as I say even in the hands of pharaohs. Now next up are bronze daggers. Now the Hyksos had introduced the uh, Egyptian kingdom to the world of bronze making shall we say and or at least improved their bronze making to the point that they started making bronze daggers. Now these are more difficult to make uh, in most cases than axes and the Egyptian ones actually had a construction where the hilt and the blade was one solid piece so they're actually very strong objects. They were possibly carried as an alternative to the axe or the mace so as a backup as a, a, a side weapon it's also possible that they became popular because they were effective against armoured opponents if you get into grappling or wrestling with them and you can uh, stab them in a place where their armour isn't. So it could be that to some degree they were anti-armour weapons as well, not for going through the armour but for going around the armour. And their blades tend to be optimised for stabbing, sort of triangular tapered and fairly pointy blades, so I think it's fair to call them daggers. It's also possible that they were introduced from neighbouring areas as well, or at least their popularity was. They pretty much always feature a straight symmetrical double-edged blade with a, a pointy uh, end to them, and they have a hilt that it has a rudimentary handguard and that's essentially shaped to keep your hand in place and stop it riding up onto the blade when stabbing with it. Now at number eight is the short sword. Now a natural evolution of the dagger of course is once the blade grows longer and changes shape a bit it becomes a sword so it doesn't take much for a knife or a dagger to evolve into a sword and this seems to be what happens because we see similar blade shapes sort of and similar hilt shapes. In fact the blades as they become longer tend to become broader as well and this is almost certainly to enable them to chop or cleave as well as stab uh, because once you've got a longer blade that's a good thing to do. So while they are still pointed they're not as pointed as the shorter daggers. So it does seem like the shorter daggers were more specialised for stabbing, the longer short swords are cut and thrust weapons. They still have bronze one piece construction and as I say they have a similar, they tend to have a similar style of hilt shape. One theory is that this tendency to moving towards swords and developing swords was influenced by the absor absorption, first defeat and then absorption of the sea peoples into the kingdom of Egypt. Now number nine is a weapon which is perhaps one of the most famous and iconic weapons of ancient Egypt which is the kopesh or kopesh as different people might pronounce it and this is often described as a sword. Now I would argue that actually it's a sort of sword axe uh, in its construction because it doesn't it's not usually edged all the way up it's usually only edged for the portion of the blade which is roughly analogous to one of the earlier middle kingdom uh, long bladed axes so my argument is that actually the kopesh is really an all bronze construction axe taking inspiration from sword construction so it's literally like marrying the bronze sword with an earlier broad bladed axe and you end up with the kopesh and this is why the blade comes forward. Now some sources confusingly refer to this as a scimitar and various other words that are associated with curved swords which I think is very um, well, wrong, I think it's a complete misconception but it's also very misleading in how this weapon is constructed. If we look at its cross section, its cross section is actually usually a T section, as I say only that projecting crescent is edged. The rest is a bar, like a shaft, a bronze bar, and then it has a handle. Uh, agreeably, the handle is like a sword hilt. So it's almost like they've married a sword hilt to a bronze shaft to a bronze axe blade, and therefore no need to bind the axe blade to a shaft. But in my view, it is really a hybrid of a sword and an axe. Now, some people have argued that the origin for the Kopesh actually comes from Syria. It's possible. Uh, however, we should also mention that the use of bronze, of course, we can credit with the Hyksos um, rule of Egypt. So I think it's a combination of factors, but ultimately now the Kopesh is most famous for its Egyptian use. Now it's important to mention that the Kopesh is a very advanced and difficult to make and expensive item. Therefore, while it may have been used by some extent by normal soldiers, um, typical infantry for example, occasionally, for the most part it seems to have been regarded as an elite weapon used by 
the commanders and the officers and indeed by pharaohs. So much so in fact that two were found in King Tutankhamun's tomb. So they're very much seen as the elite type of hand weapon. I, I'm hesitant to use the word sword here um, because I think it's a sword axe hybrid but I think they're the elite hand weapon of the uh, of the new kingdom. The tenth and final weapon is a chariot. Now Egyptian chariots have actually, they're one of those weapons along with bows that have actually got a fair amount of attention in academic studies. I would argue that spears and swords and even kopesh haven't received enormous amount of attention uh, and could, there could be a lot more study done on those. But chariots have received quite a lot and chariots are very very interesting. They come in a couple of varieties. At a certain point they switch for example from four spoked wheels to six spoked wheels. They had a suspension leather um, sort of strap suspension system in them. Uh, they were very light, they were designed for speed, they were pretty much always equipped with two horses um, and they were the the chariot, the, the vehicle essentially of the of Egypt's cavalry. This was their cavalry and they were ridden by the elites. So uh, it was the, you know, the pharaoh led a cavalry, uh, a, a chariot squadron. Um, all of the people in the chariots pretty much would have been social elites within Egypt. So this was the elite fighting force and you've got to think about why that is. Well it requires money to learn to, you know, to even just to own chariots requires money but even to learn to ride in them you need to have access to them. So much like uh, medieval knights for example with their horses and their armour, the chariot almost required you to be a social elite in order to have access to its use from an early age and be effective in it. Now these chariots, I've mentioned they had two horses, they were very light, great suspension, optimised for speed and manoeuvrability, um, and they were almost always um, had two people inside them, or typically had two people. One driver, one fighter is the way that most people describe it, although of course in certain situations both those people could fight. For this reason the chariot was equipped with a number of weapons, I would argue principally the bow, so one person would be manoeuvring and driving around and the other person would be acting like mounted archery. A mounted archer rather, um, but they also had access to javelins to throw, for example if, they're, uh, if someone got close uh, or they um, ran out of arrows, um, and usually a hand weapon or even a couple of hand weapons like the kopesh or an axe or a mace or something like this. Uh, and often we do see the kopesh and remember that these are elites in the chariots so the kopesh is a fairly elite hand weapon as well. So these were, these became, and only after the Hyksos, so as well as bronze and socketed spearheads and all of these things that the Hyksos, and uh, composite bows, that the Hyksos rule of Egypt introduced into Egypt's new kingdom thereafter, um, chariots were one of those things. Chariots are not really a thing before in Egypt, but become a massively important thing from the New Kingdom onwards. It's also worth mentioning in passing as well that chariot crews were often armoured when a lot of, or most of, the Egyptian army was not. So typically, uh, if we trust the sources that we have available to us, both uh, written and artistic, Egyptian armies relied on their shields. They didn't have much armour at all. Maybe some, there's some sort of strapped type armour around the torsos occasionally. But the chariot crews, in contrast, um, it's often uh, suggested that they were wearing uh, coats of scale, essentially. Uh, so scale armour, which would have made them, had a much higher survivability rate because number one, they're now wearing armour and helmets. But additionally, they're in a chariot, so if something goes wrong, they can run away, they can flee the battlefield and survive, while the poor old infantry have to trust to their legs. So. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons. One, because they wanted to increase the survivability of the uh, chariot crews so they could operate, but also bear in mind these are, are, are elites buying their own equipment or providing their own equipment often, so therefore they can afford to armour themselves better. So chariot crews were often the best armoured as well as otherwise best equipped of the Egyptian army. So those are my absolute top 10 weapons of ancient Egypt's new kingdom. I'm going to give a sort of honourable mention, or sort of, should we say more passing mention rather than honourable, to the so-called Mace Axe, which numerous people have written about, but for which there is an exceedingly small, scant amount of evidence for. And so some people have argued there's a type of weapon, and these have been shown in things like Osprey books and stuff, they've been reconstructed in art, which include a, a mace with a ball head and an axe blade. Now actually, if you look at the primary source material, there, and archeology span for example, there is almost no evidence to support their existence, as far as I can tell so far. 
if you know I'm wrong in that, if you know of any archaeologically found examples, post below because I'm very interested to see them. But I didn't include them in my list because I can't really find any credible evidence for them and therefore how could I include them in a list of the 10 most important weapons when it's even dubious that they existed at all. So I hope this has been illuminating to watch. I will continue researching Egyptian arms and armour because I I'm finding it absolutely fascinating, but also I think it's a great avenue of research if any of you out there are looking to branch into something new. Because there, to my point of view, there hasn't done, been a huge amount done on it compared to other periods. If you want to find books on arms and armour of other parts of the world or other periods, uh, you can find lots of stuff written down. But there, surprisingly, for the amount written about ancient Egypt, there isn't a huge amount written about the warfare arms and armour, and there's a lot of unknown still. So I think it's a fascinating area to research. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up and um, it makes a big uh, uh, help to me on the channel and, and motivates me when I see those uh, little thumbs up. And also, you know, share the video around uh, with someone you think might be interested in it. And I hope that I will see you back on Scholar Gladiatoria channel really soon. Thanks for watching. I have been Matt Easton and I will continue to be.